What's up everybody? Today we're going to be going over coronary artery disease. And as I was kind of mentioning to everybody in this little pre-show, if you don't know what the pre-show is, I kind of make some announcements on the Facebook group. So join the PTA board study group on Facebook. It is not the PTA elevation paid coaching program. That is for my students who pay for my course, but every week we go live in the PTA board study group. And we kind of talk about a different condition. You guys get to be live, ask questions, get it all in real time. So definitely join the group if you're not already a part of it. All right, let's get started with coronary artery disease. This is essentially atherosclerosis slash arterial sclerosis in the coronary arteries. Remember the coronary arteries are the arteries that supply blood to the heart muscle itself. So super important. We really don't want those arteries to have problems. And this is where we kind of talk about if somebody needs surgery, they'll have the coronary like bypass graft stents placed, and that's just to increase blood flow to the area. So let's get into it. So you guys are gonna be surprised what I say when we have anatomy. Wow, the heart. Wow, so it's wow, the heart. Yes. So heart is the main thing what's associated with uh heart like what are we talking about? Coronary artery disease at a moment. Uh and the coronary arteries, as I said before, those are the arteries that supply blood to the heart. It's affecting mostly the left and right coronary arteries. The left one tends to get affected a little bit more than the right. Remember the right coronary artery that's going to supply blood to the right atrium and then blood to the right ventricle. The left will supply the left atrium and the left ventricle. So we can see if that's causing a problem, whether it was blood not getting to the areas that supply blood to everywhere else, we're having a serious problem. This is how somebody with a blockage here in one of the arteries, if it's a plaque buildup or something, that's what causes a myocardial infarction or what we normal people know as is a heart attack. So it's going to affect the cardiac muscles. It's going to affect blood flow and oxygen supply to the cardiac muscles. Remember, if muscles die, they stay dead. So, and muscles do not regenerate, no matter if it's skeletal, uh, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, they don't regenerate. So we wanna make sure that we're always keeping blood flow to the area. So that's why we would have interventions surgically. We aren't doing those. Those are for people who make a lot more money than we do, um, who are going to be opening up those arteries with stents and stuff like that. So the main thing that we're going to see is it's a narrowing of the arteries or a stenosis of the arteries due to plaque buildup. So that's why we'll see this happen with people who are on a high cholesterol diet or have high levels of cholesterol in their blood. They're going to have that fatty plaque buildup in their arteries, which is going to restrict blood flow, which would restrict oxygen to the cardiac muscles, which would prevent them from doing things. See how it's just a snowball. That's kind of what's going on with this. So etiology, as I was kind of alluding to slash sort of mentioned in the past, atherosclerosis, that's where we have sclerotic buildup in the blood vessels, usually due to a plaque fatty buildup in the arteries, which is going to lead to, which is uh, due to increased levels of cholesterol in the blood. So we're going to have high levels of H of LDL, a little bit higher levels of HDL. Remember high HDL would be over 60. High LDL is going to be over, I believe, 120 because you don't want your total cholesterol over 200. That's why when you get your blood taken, if you see that your total serum cholesterol is over 200, I think it's like milligrams per deciliter, whatever the unit is, um, that's where we're starting to see a problem. And we don't want the that to go too high because that's where we have the plaque buildup and that's bad. So uh, we don't want that to build up in the arteries over time. We're going to see our risk factors and other things happening because of this is going to be hypertension. Generally, hypertension hypertension is a problem with any sort of cardiac condition or cardiopulmonary condition. It's going to cause a lot of problems. That's why it's one of the more preventable things. We can either take medication, we can change our diet or something like that. That's why we, that's why if your blood pressure is high, we're like, Oh no, really bad, bad. We don't want to do that. So, um, we don't want hypertension, elevated cholesterol or triglyceride levels. That's another thing that we're going to see when it comes to know, fat buildups and everything, any sort of fat material or whatnot, a family or genetic history of coronary artery disease. That just means you're more prone to like atherosclerosis and you're more prone to having plaque buildup in the arteries. We see that there's that familial, uh, kind of connection. Smoking, smoking is one of those things that it just, it doesn't do anything good. It's going to cause problems, you know, with emphysema, COPD, chronic bronchitis, going to cause problems with blood flow to the area. That's the main thing. It's decreased oxygen. It increases your risk of blood clots. For example, like if you're on birth control, you already have an increased risk of blood clots. If you have uh, smoking on top of it, that makes it even more. So smoking is generally bad. Generally being too stressed or having those high levels of those catecholamines and epinephrine, norepinephrine floating around, that's just going to increase your blood pressure. And that's going to increase your problems with coronary artery disease. And then also 
problems with the heart requiring too much demand. So we don't want stress. We don't want higher levels of any of our catecholamines or cortisol. So we really want to make sure we're keeping the stress levels down. Alcoholism, again, alcoholism, kind of the same thing as, um, smoking, it really, it doesn't really do anything good for you. So, uh, and this is like getting into severe alcoholism, um, not talking like a drink or so a night, like, no, we're talking like chronic alcoholism causing lots of problems. Sedentary lifestyle, again, usually kind of linked to the diet and when they, you know, don't move too much, eat bad food, high in cholesterol, platic filled up. Yep. Diabetes mellitus, same sort of issue. Um, and that's going to cause problems with perfuse, um, oxygen transport into the cells. That's another thing. Obesity, same thing with the sedentary lifestyle. And then kidney disease. We want to take care of our beans. Our beans are important. We want them to work and we want them to filter out the bad things. If they don't filter out the bad things, the bad things go places they're not supposed to be, aka the heart. So what does it look like? So the main thing that we're going to see with coronary artery disease, it's going to like mild cases, it's going to cause angina pectoris. So that's another condition. Definitely look over for the boards. So that's like an ischemic attack to the heart musculature. So I like to think of it as angina pectoris is like a TIA, but in the heart. So remember TIA is transient ischemic attack. That's with like mini stroke kind of thing. This is like a mini heart attack. You're going to have ischemia to the heart, which means that blood flow is literally going to stop flowing to the heart muscle, which isn't good at all. So that person is going to have, you know, chest pain, all the symptoms is sort of like a heart attack. If they're having it at rest, that's what's considered unstable angina. And I'll make another video about this to explain it, but, um, unstable angina is going to cause essentially could cause a heart attack. If you have uh, uh, angina upon exertion or something like that, or it's predictable, that would be called stable angina. And that should respond well to nitroglycerin. Remember, they're going to take a sublingual tablet of the nitroglycerin and they can only take that up to three times because it's going to take your blood pressure too much if we take it more than three times. So they can take it three times, five minute intervals, inter five minute increments apart. And then if they take it the third time and they don't respond, that's when we need to call EMS services because then it could become unstable and then result in a heart attack. So just a little, you know, spark notes version of that, because that is important to know for the exam. So we're going to see that we have this ischemia blockage of blood flow to the heart muscle, and that's going to start causing, that's what coronary artery disease starts out as, and it eventually ends up as a heart attack. So we're going to see that all the same risk factors you have for hypertension and atherosclerosis apply. So if you didn't see those, check out the peripheral vascular disease video. I go more in detail about that or podcasts, wherever you're listening to this video podcast. Hello. If you're in your car, wait till you get to wherever you're going. Um, shortness of breath upon exertion. So that's the same thing we were kind of talking about that exertion causing that angina kind of, you know, symptoms in their chest and whatnot. And then it's going to um, increase uh, like the weakness. It's going to get more weak as we perform more activities, we get more tired, more fatigued. That's what we're kind of seeing with this. Essentially, we put this, if we want to put it in simple terms, we put this dude on the recumbent bike, he's going for five minutes and then he's like absolutely winded and he's like done. That's what we're seeing when it comes to coronary artery disease. It's going to affect coronary arteries of the heart and decrease their ability to pump blood efficiently through the body, which is going to cause problems doing pretty much anything that requires activity. So how are we treating it? And there's a lot of things on this page, but let me break it down. If it's a severe blockage, like I'm talking, you know, when they say like, oh, my grandpa went in for heart surgery and he had 95% blockage in his coronary arteries. That's when we would do something called, a, I say we, it's the people, the cardiothoracic people who are going to do a cardiac catheterization. So they're going to do a coronary angioplasty. And this is where they're going to insert that little balloon with a tube kind of going up through their body. And it's going to go from the femoral artery down in the leg, all the way up into the heart, you know, that we're kind of tracing it backwards into the aorta. And then we're going into the coronary arteries wherever we needed to go. That's kind of where it's going. We're going to put this little balloon in and we're going to open it up. And I have a picture on the next page. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, just go check it out on YouTube. I have a picture of how we kind of insert this and it opens up. And then what that's doing is it's pushing all the plaque to the sides. And it's essentially as if you've like gone into like one of those little bouncy houses and you like push all of the like walls to the side and then you, you can get through. That's kind of what's going on with the cardiac stent to increase blood flow. Because the problem with this is that we're not having any blood flow to the area. 
And you know, no blood flow is gonna cause lots of problems. So that's what's going on with that. The patient might be on nitroglycerin. We kind of talked about that for their angina. So understanding the medications that they could be on like ACE inhibitors and stuff like that. Remember with ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, all of that stuff that addresses hypertension, we will see a diminished response to exercise with exert like exertion. So like, let's say like for me, I mean, like I'm standing here and my heart rate's already going up, just like, you know, talking, bouncing around. I got a standing desk now. And so like, I'm at like 83 beats per minute, just standing here, moving my arms and stuff. If I was going to start, you know, jogging in place, doing some jumping jacks and stuff, already worked out today. I'm already tired. Um, my heart rate would start going up. So like, I'm going to do like four or five jumping jacks, woo, kind of swinging around. And now my heart rate has gone up to 87. Okay. Now it's at 92. So my heart rate's starting to go up, which is normal for somebody who was on beta blockers or anything like, um, ACE inhibitors. What's going to happen is the patient is not going to have as much response to exercise. So like I'm on the bike, I'm going on the bike like faster. And like, I'm at like 135, 140 beats per minute, you know, I'm breathing. Okay. Like whatever. And like, they start off at like 80 and like, maybe they go up to 90. So they're going to have a diminished response to exercise. So we would have to use rate of perceived exertion in order to determine that. So like the Borg scale, the Borg RPE scale, that's what we're using. So the patient might also be on like statins for cholesterol, um, understanding what's going on with that, the side effects, like the gastrointestinal distress and whatnot. Um, and so we got to make sure this is a patient that we got to understand what meds they're on. All of our cardiac patients who have had lots of cardiac incidents and problems, they're going to be on this long laundry list of medications. It is our responsibility as a PTA to know like, okay, if my dude is on like an, uh, like, you know, the anticoagulant, they're going to bleed more. If my girl over here is on a beta blocker, they're not going to have that response to exercise. They could have hypotension. Make sure that we understand what's going on with our pharmacology. Um, if you're watching this and you're in my prep course, I got a video on pharmacology. Go watch that. It sums everything up in about 30 minutes. So um, we're making sure we're keeping an eye on the side effects for treatment. Our PT interventions are going to be, you know, general medical strength and conditioning, um, just getting them back to doing the things, being careful of like what stage of cardiac rehab are they in, what's an appropriate level of meds to exercise this patient at, and just monitoring their vitals through stuff. So making sure we're not having any episodes of that hypertension where the blood pressure is spiking. And then also we do do some education on diet modification, but they should be seeing an RD, so a registered dietitian for that, um, and understanding what's going on with their cardiac rehab. And if they go through like open heart surgery, remember like our dude who had like the whole, I think of my friend's dad who had like a quadruple bypass or whatever. So he was in cardiac rehab. We had the heart pillow to help them stand up because they can't use their upper extremities, no valsalving, no like pec stretching, follow those precautions that are associated with um, open heart surgery, no lifting and whatnot. They're on restrictions and stuff like that. So no breath holding for this patient keep an eye on what's going on, know the precautions of their medications and whatever potential surgery they might have had. So this is my picture of a cardiac stent. You can see it goes through the femoral artery here. This is a really crusty picture, but that's okay. It goes all the way up to where the plaque is. And then it opens up and just pushes everything to the side. That's what's happening during a cardiac catheterization. Um, and sometimes they'll use like dye. So that's what the dye is right there to help guide the balloon angioplasty where it needs to go. So keywords for this is understanding when it comes to coronary artery disease, we got angina pectoris is essentially they have it. Like that's the, why they're getting the chest pain. Why like, that's what's going on. The reason why someone has angina pectoris is because they have coronary artery disease and they have coronary artery disease because they have elevated cholesterol and that's going to cause a plaque buildup, narrow the arteries. Remember if we think of how it works for, um, that's going to increase our blood pressure. If we have a smaller space to go through, think of like, if you're watering your plants with like the regular hose, and then like, if you want to make it like spray farther and stuff, you're going to close it a little bit. So you're going to narrow the, the, um, exit of the water the opening, and that's going to have the water shoot farther. Same things happening in your arteries as they get smaller. It's just physics. <laughs> um, as they get smaller, there's going to be more speed going through there, more pressure and everything. And that's going to cause hypertension, which is bad. We don't want hypertension. Atherosclerosis, that is just the buildup of plaque. So we should associate that with like, you know, all of our coronary artery, peripheral vascular, peripheral arterial disease, all of that fun stuff. And then cardiac catheterization with angioplasty. This is a very common thing that will be done to address coronary artery disease um, with these patients. And then a stent would be what's placed. So these are keywords that we're all looking at this and we're saying like every single one of these, we're checking a box off saying, 
probably uh, coronary artery disease. Hypertension causes lots of problems. And generally hypertension is like the biggest thing that we're like, oh, this is the common theme. Maybe we should lower our blood pressure. So everyone's favorite part, the sample question. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient diagnosed with coronary artery disease. The patient is currently on Lipitor to manage their condition. What is a common side effect associated with this medication? And I already hear people right now saying, oh, Brie, why would you ask this? Because the board is going to ask this. All right. So what's a common side effect associated with the medication Lipitor? One, gastrointestinal distress. Two, excessive bruising or bleeding. Three, diminished heart rate response to exercise. Or four, orthostatic hypotension. So I'll give you guys a second to think about this. And I did already give you guys the hint to the answer. All right, my friends. So the answer is number one, gastrointestinal distress. So Lipitor, if you don't know what that is, fortunately it says lippy in the name, which is like close enough to lipids. So this is going to affect lipids, which what lipid are we worried about? We're worried about cholesterol. So this is what is called a statin. And that's going to help lower your levels of cholesterol in the blood. A lot of people, when they end up taking this medication, end up having a really upset stomach, GI distress, and I've had patients cancel their appointments because they started this medication and they felt really sick, nausea, vomiting. That is a common side effect that will affect our PT treatment. Can't really get much done with a patient who feels like they want to throw up every time they stand up. That's kind of what's going on. So that's why are the side effects of these medications have huge implications for PT, but let's go through the other ones. So number two was excessive bleeding slash bruising that would be associated with like our antiplatelets, anticoagulants, thrombolytics, and stuff like that. Those things that help not make the blood clot. If they end up bumping something, they could bleed more. They could bruise more than normal because there's not as many things floating like platelets and stuff floating around, uh, coagulating things aren't coagulating <laughs> things aren't, um, uh, going together and clotting things and whatnot. And uh, that's good if we don't want them to have blood clot, but if they end up cutting their finger, it's gonna bleed for like five minutes straight. Um, so that's not good. Number three, diminished heart rate response to exercise. This is what I talked about with our ACE inhibitors, our beta blockers, our calcium channel blockers. This is going to be where we use Borg rate of perceived exertion to measure the intensity of the exercise. And that is so important. And the boards will ask you about that because they wanna make sure you understand if you don't see the numbers go up. That's why then orthostatics, hypotension, same thing with like, you know, diuretics, uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, everything that's going to lower uh, your blood pressure. We could accidentally overshoot and lower it too low that you end up getting orthostatic hypotension. So you start your medication. You're like, oh, this is great. I'm like no longer having high blood pressure. Oh, wow. I'm about to pass out when I stand up. So those are the things we want to think about. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming to this today. And I will see y'all in the next video. Hope that this was helpful.